Hi everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Vivian. Uh, here as Energy Minister. Um, just uh, give you a bit of sharing of uh, how I came, how I came to this show building. I feel a bit stressed. Uh, stressful a little bit because all of you are like uh, uh, oil and gas uh, experience with you now. I used to be in oil and gas, but you know, just for a short while. And that uh, now that I'm a minister, that suddenly everyone wants to ask me what is your decision on certain things, right? Um, um, actually, I come uh, with a very, very open mind on what we can do as a nation. And I would like to learn from uh, from Dr. and from everyone of you on what we can do. Um, so, how do I feel in this one? Uh, um, I, I, I have three portfolios. Uh, one is on energy. Uh, one is on science and technology, and then another one is on uh, climate change and environment. <coughs> so it is a big. Uh, it is actually. It's actually yeah. a big. Uh, yeah. 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 Hello. Okay. Uh, it's actually a big. Uh, it's actually a big, very, very big industry. But I also see that this is a real challenge. Um, and that uh, just now I've heard uh, Dr. Cho uh, saying that uh, how we as a nation have to move. But uh, uh, a lot of time, whenever I talk, think about climate change, um, I always thought that you know Malaysia is very a very, very small country. Um, that uh, what is our role in this small world, right? And, and in this and, and in such a small country in this big world, what is our role and how we can take advantage of it? Um, I felt that. Um, um, this new Malaysia, or me becoming a minister, is actually not about uh, a certain position or that uh, suddenly someone has power, but it's really opening up a new possibility for Malaysia, uh, a new reimagination for uh, what is to come for our country. And that suddenly climate change becomes an issue that people are actually uh, concerned about. Right? Suddenly, uh, things that th people think that everything is possible so so i came as a, a, a um, in this month i think that there is a lot of optimism among malaysians and that so uh, we want to keep that optimism not only through that uh, 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 a, an imagination but really through our actions and uh, so i'm here to listen to you and hopefully as ministers uh, we can actually enable the industry uh, to be an enabler to meet our goal thank you The audience, will you have the opportunity to ask questions? Uh, feel free and uh, put out your hands, and uh, the mark will come to you. So, before we go further to you, just maybe you yeah. can ask your input a bit. So, you've been involved uh, not only as an NGA president, uh, you see what the industry is happening. But what's your take on what's going on today and listening from Dr. Joy as well? What is going on today in Malaysia? In Malaysia, specifically? Um, I think, uh, first of all, I think. I'd like to comment on the set of the ministry. I and mean, having been involved in this area before the main election, I find it example putting the energy ministry and the climate change ministry as one entity uh, will facilitate it. Because I see an example like in the past, there are things that we do, they go in the opposite direction. For example, the committed to COP21, but at the same time also we did a lot of coal power plants. I think it's something that, to me as a gas person, that's something that. Uh, something that I have to fight with on a, on a regular basis. And I think like Minister said, that is something that gives us a new hope. For example, even though achieving government should be difficult, but it is something that we should strive to achieve so that if not there, we can be close to that uh, target. So Dr. Cho, were you involved in the Paris Agreement? Uh, not directly, but of course we follow Paris very closely. My colleague David Horn, who is our chief CO2 advisor, was at the Paris negotiations. Uh, and uh, it's, but as I said, you know, it's just the start of a long and difficult journey. It's not the conclusion. Were you aware about what ASEAN countries were doing, or in Malaysia in particular, during the Paris Agreement? And what were your thoughts? I mean, looking from an external point of view towards Malaysia and this region. Awesome. So I take a very high level view. Uh, I don't necessarily look at individual countries. We are doing starting to do some work on individual countries. But what I say is this, everyone is in the same boat. It's a bit like squeezing a balloon. You can squeeze it at one end, but then the other end starts to expand, uh, itself defeating. 
everyone needs to act together. Of course, the problem in emissions was caused by the countries that had developed earlier, but nevertheless, they cannot be the only ones to deal with the problem that has emerged. Everyone, as part of that human community, has to act together for the common good. Anyone has? Uh, yes? Mr. Engineer Groom is saying. Can I shout? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gouvet. Hello. Nice to see you. Congratulations, YP, on your appointment. It's the first time I'm speaking to you as a minister. Although you didn't reply my email. So <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm a bit disturbed by your statement that saying Malaysia is a small emitter. It's very misleading. We are the third highest per capita emitter in ASEAN. You know? So I think you need to check your facts a little bit because you are sending the wrong message. Perhaps. Your climate team is not adequately brief you because I followed climate change for donkey years and I'm very disturbed and my colleagues also in the climate NGO community are also worried that you are sending out the wrong message. And this was the signal people were telling me many years ago when I went around the country talking why we should be concerned about climate change. They said, oh, it's the US. We are not doing anything. But look at the emissions from our cars and look at what Mahathir is proposing, another car project rather than public transport. So I think it's very, very dangerous to say that we don't need to worry about this climate change. I also am worried that you are seen giving the message, oh, it's something that can be fixed by technology. I know you're a technologist. I'm also a technologist. And my experience is technology alone cannot solve this problem. Value system. People switching to public transport. Therefore, it's very important your new government pushes for public transport because, you know, rather than cars, rather so that we have less emissions because if you look at the statistics, transport sector in Malaysia is the second highest emitter of carbon after the electricity industry. So I'm worried about that. Secondly, I think this sky scenario, I'm very skeptical about Paris. I don't think Paris is in such a great deal as it made out to be because if you look globally, global emissions keep on going up. We have now gone to 420 ppm almost. What are the people talking about 2 degrees C and all this sort of thing? I don't think the rate at which countries are behaving, the big countries, we can ever get 2 degrees C, no matter what the sky projection is and all that. We need drastic action and the biggest emitters, well, this climate debate has been full of hypocrisy. The biggest emitters, including the USA, don't want to do anything. They expect others to do. I think that this world is a very unequal world, very selfish world, and we need to get people focused together. Our common future is at stake. I won't be around for 2070, I'm sure. Uh, I won't live that long. But I'm worried about it that the future of children is being sacrificed globally. Nobody is doing actually. The developed countries are not doing enough. They are pointing the fingers at developing countries. That has been our debate all along. You know? so, until and unless that debate can resolve, of course, we can do our share. We cannot keep point, pointing fingers at others. We also have to do something. So I have been always advocating, we Malaysians, for example, how many of you drove here? And how many of you came by public transport? That was a good example. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kubel was with me in one of the forums. We talked about the total emission as a total emitter and per capita, right? So I've shown the slides of, to the students in some way, remember? So actually I understand what you're talking about and uh, what is the per capita emission and all that. But eventually as a total emitter, we are still a small one. I, I'm not talking about per capita, I'm talking about total emitter. Um, that uh, I, you probably have missed one of my um, article on climate change, uh, on like, how as a small country as well we can actually contribute and how we can actually leverage on a a low carbon future to build our industry here. So you can go to my website www.yobi.com to read about climate change. I believe you will read it. And um, Mr. Gubin is a very, very good environmentalist. Um, he is appearing in every uh, environment uh, dialogue. So welcome, uh, Mr. Gubin. We need people like you um, to help us to push uh, government to be more radical in our, in our thinking. And uh, so that is the first one. The second one uh, on the national car. Um, there, there's no decision uh, made yet, I, I, I would just say that uh, there's no decision, uh, firm decision made yet on which uh, the direction that the country, uh, that the, the country is going um, and that um, 
So, and the rail and all that, we are actually also expanding our, our rail. Uh, it's just maybe not at the scale that people, uh, not at the scale where the previous uh, planner actually planned, because some of the rail uh, stations are uh, vastly oversized, where you can actually not be able to uh, reach the capacity in 20 years. So we really need to recalibrate uh, our route in MRT. Uh, a lot of people say that, oh, we need to solve the problem, uh, or therefore we let's build more rail, right? No, no, no. But you more buses. Uh, more buses yeah. and, uh, okay. okay, so buses we are increasing. So if you actually okay. listening to uh, Anthony Lok uh, on the, 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 the change, uh, the Minister of Transport actually uh, trying to increase the buses, but not the rail yet. Uh, yet MRT 3, we are continuing on, uh, but MRT, uh, we are uh, putting a hold, a hold for recalibration. I think it is very important. That it's very important that we count the cost as a nation, and that we do cost and benefit analysis whenever and uh, what is this design and what is the alignment, right? So, so I thought that uh, uh, it is unfair to say that the government is actually moving into a more carbon intensive uh, future and I'm, I'm on it, uh, so don't worry about that. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I just may just add a couple of comments to what uh, 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 Ms. Hill has just said. Uh, firstly, sir, um, I share your passion, I share your concern. I actually think we need more people like you, not just in Malaysia, but around the world, because, absolutely, because uh, remember what I said about the sky scenario, underpinning every element of change in sky is a shift in mindset. Unless we have more people like you, we will not get that sky scenario realized. The second point I'd like to make is that, don't forget, Sky is only one of three scenarios that we have which meet Paris. The other scenarios do not. So the hour is late, the need is urgent, we have to move with great speed uh, to address this critical problem. I share that concern. The third and last thing I will say is that as you saw from the chart, we all recognize that emissions are rising. Even Paris recognizes that too. But unless emissions peak very soon within the next seven, eight years, and start to decline globally, uh, we will not get to that sky target. So I do believe sky sets out a path. We have shown that with our scenario, that is technically feasible. Whether we get to it or not is up to us as individuals around the world. So let's come back to the topic of sky. So I think the, the challenge for many countries is actually to have a, a, a holistic and, and focused effort and for the first time in Malaysian history, you, we have a ministry that actually encompasses everything. You have the energy, which is one of the biggest energy, uh, a carbon emitter, then you have science technologies, and a climate change environment. So what are the plans that you have immediately within a month, and how much of the relevance of sky that you've heard that can be applied? Um, so when I was uh, listening to Dr. Cho, I, was just have a, I just have a mind that Wow, they are talking about sky scenario. Now I'm trying to bring you down on the on the, on, on Earth, right? Uh, what is really happening uh, in Malaysia? So let me give you a, a perspective into uh, what is happening in the government. So I was told that I will be a climate change minister. So so I I went into it was used to be natural resources and environment. So they bring the natural resources from the environment, and the environment goes to with the energy as well as science and technology. So I, when I went there, I asked. So, how big is the climate change unit? So, and the environment side people tell me five persons. <laughs> um, so, so in order for us to move forward, I, I mean, I just tell you what is real. Uh, you are talking about sky, uh, but uh, now Malaysia. What is real is that in the government you have five persons in the section. So, what is going to happen uh, in a, in in a, uh, quite close future is two or three months down the road. Uh, at the moment, because there is a shift in the ministry, the agencies are different. Uh, so so we, we have not finalized which agencies under which ministry yet. So the moment it is finalized, um, so the people that is in my ministries, I know which agencies, the first thing we are going to do is to do a restructuring. So when we do a restructuring in the government, 
uh, because I have three portfolio big ones and then um, you will always have a management administration side of it. So what we are going to do is we want to keep the management as lean as we possibly can and move people into the core business. We have three core business, environment, energy and as well as the science and technology. And uh, on the environment side, because five persons is not enough for a climate change uh, and then we rely too much on the uh, people outsource uh, some of the uh, reports to the outsource, right? Uh, we need to build uh, capacity within the uh, ministry. So we are targeting about 20 people to form uh, uh, about 20 people in the immediate two or three months. But then in the, in the years to come, uh, uh, an ideal one is 60 people. The first thing that this thing uh, need to do, we are, we are looking into a few things. First one is carbon accounting. Um, for your information, we can't, haven't even count our carbon yet. I'm going to talk about how you reduce it because you can't even count it properly. Um, so now our estimation is actually very different than uh, real carbon accounting. And the first thing we need to do is really know what is our 2005 because our, ours is a 2005 standard. What is our 2005 and then how do we accurately uh, calculate our carbon and which industry because only with good data that you will be able to pro properly plan your uh, strategy, right? So the first thing, the second is on uh, uh, on planning uh, for your information because reducing carbon. Uh, if you have a climate change, uh, we signed the Paris Agreement uh, two two years ago. Um, but for your information, there is no plan yet, right? So it was signed very ambitious, thirty five plus ten. Uh, but when I went into a business, I say any. Uh, plan, like action plan that I, we, we are following, uh, no plan yet. So, so the first thing we need to do is also to come up with a plan, but you cannot come up with a plan with a, without a carbon accounting. So, so it will be, um, so that there will be a plan, that this plan will cover a few sections, right? These sections will then need to be monitored because they will be by different ministry. For example, transport is not under the ministry, and transport is a big one, right? So, so how do we move across as this climate change center, where we will call it climate change center, as a focal point of different ministries to monitor the carbon emission. Uh, so those, and then the third one is this: is that because the government has no money, um, so many of you have seen the. Uh, my immediate concern is really how do I use the least money from the government of Malaysia to make the biggest impact. And actually, then we found out that there is a lot of untapped uh, international funding that we have not uh, applied. Uh, for example, Global Climate Change Fund, uh, different different funding, Red Plus, and etc. So what we are going to do right now is that uh, in the climate change section, we want to build capacity for people to be able to propose, to give proposal, to get the funding from international funding. So actually, the government money is to build capacity to get the government funding. So, and then we, we have some uh, fundings, but most, most mostly will be from the, uh, from the international, etc. But on the energy side, uh, we actually are coming out with Energy Efficiency Act. Uh, energy Efficiency Act will come on, uh, it will be, the first draft will be ready by end of the year, or will be opening up for energy, uh, for players, power players to actually come uh, back to us for feedback. But hopefully by next year, we'll be able to uh, have the uh, Energy Efficiency Act uh, come online. Uh, but even without that, I think uh, we also had a plan. Uh, uh, the government has a lot of plans, but it's just they don't execute the plan. Um, so the plan was ready, a uh, National Energy Efficiency Action Plan was ready in 2016. Uh, but it wasn't uh, followed through. So one of the first things that I think I want to do is to get people to follow through the uh, energy, if, uh, National Energy Efficiency Action Plan first before we have the uh, Energy Efficiency Act. So these are some of the things that, uh, that is happening in the, in, the, in the ministry. And then uh, we are also thinking about this is that when we talk about renewable energy, so many of you have heard some, some of the things that we do in the uh, renewable energy sector. But it's not complete yet. But I think by the end of the year or beginning of next year, it will be announced as a comprehensive power sector reform together with renewable energy. You cannot have to push renewable energy without a power sector reform. Now we have a very rigid power uh, sector. So how do we actually have a smooth transition? And I cannot tell you today because I will actually make the market uh, shake up a little bit also. So I can't tell you today how we are going to 
do that, but uh, the government is really looking into it on how do we push like uh, renewable energy into the market and to, to use the market force instead of the government top down because government has no money, but we believe that with technology, we will to build three things, right? Whenever we talk about government goal, uh, we are always talking about that, especially on the Asian side. We are always talking about let the government give the money, let the government give the expertise, let the government do it. Uh, but I always think that of this is that three things that is important for us to reach a goal. Technology, talent, people, another one is money, right? Capital. I, I feel that uh, there, there is a lot for us to grow. Um, we were for statistics uh, recently, I just saw that uh, most of the investment in green technology in Malaysia is actually funded by domestic. They are not, uh, there is no vibrant uh, um, investment, um, foreign direct investment in the, in the green energy sector. Why? So I, we, are, we are actually doing the study on that and how do we actually create a capital market or, or, or uh, confidence in investors to invest in green technology in Malaysia and what sort of uh, signals that we need to give, what sort of government policies. But I am only one month in office, so, um, so, so I cannot tell you the exact plan, but this, is the, this will be the direction moving forward and some of the studies have been begun. I think by the end of the year, we will have a clearer idea and that I, I will be able to be more ready to share uh, this plan to you. So Hansli, how would you value the industries to support? I think it's mainly, nothing I mean, that is more of the clearer energy mix policy. For example, like the gas industry in Malaysia. For Singapore, it's somehow it's more always okay because we can encourage the asset investment to go and stay the LNG outlet. But if you look at the peninsula of Malaysia, in terms of, we are not really spurring any investment for gas in the asset sector for peninsula of Malaysia because people are not sure what do we do with our gas. They definitely do not want the domestic gas pricing because they say it's too cheap. But I think those are the kind of spin off effect that we need to create. For example, the, the, the clear energy policy. So that we, for example, like I'm also from Petronas, we can encourage people to come and invest. And this is to use international money, not domestic money. Like what we said earlier, let's get investors to take the risk. You know, in any production sharing contract, only when they produce, they get the cost recover. That's something that we have to take advantage of. At the same time, also, Actually, Malaysia, we are at the center of the, I would say, energy, especially for gas. We do send, we do sell some gas to, for example, like Vietnam, Thailand. And we do sell also to Singapore, just not, not so well known to people. These are the kind of market also that we like to share with the investors so that they come and invest long you know, in our industries and create the high value job. So maybe, Dr. Cho, you have a very good summary of kind of the steps, right? Maybe you can uh, repeat it again, just listening it one time, people forget. <laughs> and how much of it perhaps can be helpful to Malaysian government, especially with ministers here? And, and I think, as I said, I mean, underpinning everything we do in Sky is a shift in mindset. So that's, why, that's why I think that first intervention from the floor was so important. We need to want to have to change both as producers and consumers. And then we need to figure out a practical way in order to bring about change. And that's where the other, other elements of Sky come in. Electrification is key because you need electrification to bring in the possibility of more renewables in the power supply mix. And then on top of that, government action is key because governments set the framework to enable industry to invest. And with it, the right, with, without the right framework to invest, the private sector will not do so. So it must have in place the right set of policies that enable uh, investment in the new uh, e energies that are coming up, which will be different from oil, gas, and coal. That's critical. Uh, and then, of course, um, I think particularly in Malaysia, I think uh, perhaps you need to think, if I may suggest, to think seriously about deforestation and reforestation. I think the, the, the whole uh, green issue is important there. And what's critical in Paris, and that comes back again to the first intervention, is that we now are in a situation where we actually have to start thinking about net negative emissions. Uh, if we had turned the corner earlier, we would not be in a position where we would have to do so, but we now have to do so. And Paris actually acknowledges it, uh, that we have to move into that territory. And that's why possibilities, this brings in the next element of Sky, CCS, uh, BECS, which, Sky, which Paris mentions, 
uh, and CCU are critical. So that's why you need to think about net negative emissions in those, uh, in, in, in those ways. So these are some of the issues that we need to think seriously about. And of course, that transformation of the whole energy sector, ultimately from oil, gas, and coal, with gas still in the mix for some time because it's needed as that backbone fuel as renewables come in. But ultimately, renewables really taking off in a big way. Any questions? Yeah, uh, My name is Thiru. I'm from uh, Petronas into climate change policies and strategies for Petronas. Uh, my question is on um, the carbon pricing that you have uh, introduced in the graph. I saw that reaching to $200 per ton of CO2. The question is, um, without the carbon price, will your sky scenario will be still at sky or will fall to mountain or to the ocean? That, that's the first question. And if you say yes, you need to have this $200, uh, what's the assumptions used? Because um, is that a global price which is applied across without considering a developed, is developed country or developed country? And um, if it is not, then how would you handle the leakages from applying such a carbon price? Where some countries apply carbon price and the heavy and carbon intensive industries move to the countries where they don't have carbon projects. This is about leakages. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great intervention. Thank you for that comment. Uh, let me just be clear. Uh, sky is a scenario that stretches the assumptions uh, that we had in mountains and oceans. Mountains and oceans are still in play. In both of those scenarios, we do not get uh, to reach the Paris target. All we are saying at Sky is that it is technically possible, but we need to put every element that we set out in that scenario in play. Uh, and an effective carbon price applied globally is critical. Now I'll say one more thing about leakages of the kind uh, that you were talking about. Yes, I think that's a serious concern, but if we think about the new technologies that are coming in place, I, didn't have time in my talk. I actually have a whole section on technology, which I cut out because uh, of reasons of time. But if you think about the new technologies that are coming into play, and if those least developed countries can leapfrog over those more intensive, carbon intensive uh, 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 phase of growth that countries up to now have followed, in particular, we've seen the Western world and China follow that path. If those countries can leapfrog to reach that advanced technological frontier more effectively, uh, that will help ameliorate the problem that we pose. But there are, there are very serious concerns that we share. May I just add on this? Uh, I actually need to ask you a question. But it's, a, it's a panel, I'm not answering the question, I'm asking you a question. Actually, on carbon trading, right? Um, the problem with the uh, with Malaysian government is this, is that we are a developing country. And that uh, if you put on a price on your carbon, then people are moving, right? People will move to Vietnam or wherever, or wherever they do not have. So, so that the, the problem with us is that our our people has not enough money. So the first thing that they need to do as government is give them enough money, right? To to have an economy that's growing. And that uh, some some people say, uh, how come your electricity price is so low? And that people are wasting. Uh, come on, our uh, our electricity price need to be low so that people can live. Uh, affordably, right? So, so these are some of the challenges that we have as a developing nation, and also I think as a developing nation, why do we need to pay for carbon, right? Where the Western world, including the Dutch, right, they have emitted historically, and all the carbon dioxide that they have emitted throughout the history and built their wealth, and they become a developed nation. Now they say no. Uh, uh, now the developing countries you have to stop producing unless there is a compensation scheme that is involved in this, and, and then we will see an inequality in, uh, in, in that. So maybe Dr. Chiu can... Absolutely, Minister, I fully agree. And the point is this, without a global carbon price, you will not get that action on climate that we need. Having said that, as you will have seen from uh, the Sky story, development is critical. I pointed to all those countries on the left of the chart that I showed, uh, you know, the development chart that I showed, and I said they have to grow. <laughs> they have to reach that basic minimum standard of living, which we calculate in energy terms at 100 gigajoules per person. So nothing grand, just the average which people in China, Ukraine are living. But they will have to get there. 
So we do understand that. We do understand the need for technology transfer. That's why I talked about the technology frontier, the new technologies that are coming in, and the need actually for global cooperation on that. So this is not to say that we are everyone, that some uh, countries are left behind or others are not in the boat. Everyone is in the boat together. The, the problem with that is this. My question is really, sorry, now, now we are debating. Right now. My question is really this. Is that who is going to pay for the historical one? How do you, let's say for example, you start the carbon trading today, right? But the carbon has been emitted like long time ago historically since the industrialization. If you look at carbon dioxide emission in the history of mankind, actually it started uh, exponentially only during industrialization. That is okay. So, so, so you you start the carbon trading today, and who is going to pay the historical price? Uh, is the developed country going to pay for it? And under your mechanism, or do we start now, or do we start actually from the from the industrialization onwards? And you should. The developed country should actually pay for their emission, their historical emission. So let me just respond in this way. At the end of the day, yes, some countries are more responsible for the problem than others. We do understand that. But we have to deal with the problem as it is today. The fact of the matter is, unless we deal with that problem as it is, uh, we will not get to a solution. So the largest emitter of, uh, uh, the largest emitter per capita today is actually China. That's a developing country by any measure. Uh, but in historical terms, that uh, you could say it was not China that actually put a lot of that carbon in the air. But nevertheless, if you don't deal with the problem with the current emitters, you're not, you're not effectively addressing the, the global problem that we all face. Who pays for it? That has to be dealt with at international level. And I'm not saying that some are not resp more responsible than others, but it has to be dealt with collectively or we will not get a solution. Because what we see is countries coming up the scale, unless they can actually develop, and they have to develop, we acknowledge that, but unless they can develop in a cleaner way than what's gone before, we will not get to that Paris target. It's all very well to say, okay, can't get there. I, I, I can see there's difficulty there, that we have two scenarios in which, in which geopolitics and economic concerns actually prevent the world from getting to two and a half, to, uh, from getting below two degrees Celsius. But if we don't get there, we will all have to live with the consequences. And the problem here is this, the effects of climate change will hit hardest first in the developing world, and they won't have the resources to deal with it. That's what I'm very concerned about, that wealthier countries will build barriers to seal themselves off as best they can from problems which will be inflicted on the developing world. And I want to stop. Do, do you analyze through, like, for example, this carbon trading, um, uh, to say that let's start now and the pricing and start now, and instead of, let's say we have a different scenario to get uh, our, to get our uh, developed world to actually pay for yeah, historical ones, uh, do you have those sort of analysis? Because let's say, for example, in the inter international uh, discussion, we, we need numbers, right? So, so, so I was just thinking out loud that, uh, I mean, as much as I, as an energy minister and as a climate change minister, I want to reduce and, uh, our carbon emission. But at the same time, I think we, we really need to think hard as Malaysia, how do we grow our economy, right? So and that cannot be done by pe penalizing us on, uh, on, on that. So no one wants yeah. to penalize Malaysia in any way. In fact, we want to encourage Malaysia to grow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we all need to recognize we're part of that interconnected global community. That's all I'm saying. So it seems that you are needed here for longer time in Malaysia. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, hello. I uh, thank you so much, well, first of all, for the presentation. The, the, and the sky scenario. I'm really glad that I came uh, to listen to this presentation because I'm really hopeful actually about this uh, because I uh, am, well, I've been dealing, as some of you know here in the past uh, few years, extensively with also uh, issues in the, in the area of sustainable energy, trying to promote the cooperation between the Netherlands and Malaysia in the area of sustainable energy. Uh, and I really believe that it is the direction you should invest in, and there are many potential uh, things from Malaysia that can be done in that area. I think there is a, there you have you have a lot of opportunity. You have many natural resources in the area of biomass 
in hydro area. I mean, there are so many things that you could invest in. So I think what uh, Skype is also telling you is uh, look at those areas to invest in and look at those areas actually if you, if you look for development. And I think what we all need to do and uh, realize is that if we want to achieve this scenario, we will need to change at all levels. It's going to be the government, and the government will have to take in impopular measures. In the Netherlands, we have presented our climate plan uh, to meet our targets, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. To uh, it, it is a combination of the, those plans and the fact that we have some issues with our natural gas resources, which are also building to the problem, but it's going to cost us a lot of money in years. And there's a discussion in politics. Should we pay that? Should we not? But then the costs of not doing it for the future would be much, much worse, much higher. So I think if we don't, if, we, if our generation is not willing to invest in these things, then we will actually leave it to the next generation, your generation, to, 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 uh, to take the, the real costs. So it's going to take a lot of, from the government side, but it's also going to take things like incentives, education. There's a lot that can be done that doesn't cost a lot of money. When I came here in Malaysia, in my residence, the energy use was enormous. And with very simple measures, uh, we managed to reduce it by 50%. Uh, I think a lot can be done in the area of energy reduction still, just by introducing very simple measures. But there's things that can be done at all kinds of levels, at government level, company levels. Very glad about the Shell engagement, also very glad about the patronizing engagement here in the Malaysia Gas Association. It's important that everyone is on board. And I also believe very much that people themselves can change uh, and, and, and add to the change. And it is by leaving your car, getting on your bicycle. That's what I'm doing as well. I have to admit, today I came by car here. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to use my bike as much as possible as well. There are many things that we can do as an individual as well. And it all adds together. I think we have to act at all levels. And the government can set the right incentives, do a lot by education, by setting examples, by subsidizing, and by, uh, by taking the right measures. So I, I hope that uh, we can continue to work together on this. Uh, we have many Dutch companies in, in, uh, in the field of technology uh, in this area as well who are willing to cooperate with Malaysian company. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the cooperation with the new Malaysian government, Malaysia Battle, uh, on this area as well. And I, I, I am very optimistic that we can achieve a lot. Thank you. Could I just say one more thing there, which is that if we look at the sky scenario, we actually have a major energy transition taking place in Southeast Asia with a ramp up in solar and wind. Uh, there's still an element of gas there because that's needed to uh, back up the renewables. But there is that major energy transition. It will happen in sky as it happens around the world. And ultimately, it's those industries that are based on those renewable energy sources that will be the economically more competitive ones in the global economy of the future. Well, I mean, just, uh, just to clarify, I just, just now I was just playing a devil advocate. I'm, <laughs> I'm all, for, all for renewable energy, and uh, um, as, uh, as the Dr. Cho and the numbers have shown, uh, there's assurance to, to us in the, the government as well, because we want to move big into solar, we're going to move big into um, actually biomass, uh, biogas, but mostly on solar and some other renewable energy. Um, I think we can build an industry here. Our industry is still not matured, and uh, I think we can build an ecosystem in, uh, for a solar industry, and then we can actually export it to, to Indonesia. We have a big market. Uh, Southeast Asia is big. Uh, actually, as a whole, Southeast Asia has big population. is growing, and we should look beyond uh, just our 30 million market, but beyond that, uh, it's our near it's our near neighbors in so don't worry, uh, we are going to cut our carbon. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I, I just want to comment now. I think uh, recently I led a team that look at Malaysia's future and the landscape. Yes. Can do that. We have time to present to you. <laughs> and we touch carbon accounting in there. And Dr. Cho, in there, we give a timeline of about 10 years to step towards the approach because otherwise it will shock the economy. And also, let me just say, for example, for us to decouple our GHG and from our GDP, we need have to go into the services industry, you know, provide the technology services. That's why I like it too that your ministry has the technology component in it. Because that is the way for us to increase the income of our people by investing in electric technology. 
I think one last comment on solar. As much as I like solar, but Malaysia is a government, is a country who's very fertile land. I don't like it when I look at the solar panel come in plan. I think the technology that I know UDP was is working on when I look at is that the solar panel that they put on the windows. If you look at the building in KL, how many windows do you have? And then I know they're using like photosynthesis concept. So that is the thing. If make it work, Malaysia is we can sell the technology. And we don't cover our land. We use the land for our agriculture. Um, just for assurance to you that um, even in our plan, uh, the land for, for food uh, will not be used for land for solar. And you will hear that. Uh, you will hear the plan end of the year. End of the year. Just be patient. Uh, all right. So so you will get that. Uh, it's not the land from for food, but it's uh, some part of but, the But area. globally, land is a critical issue because it's required in so many different areas for agriculture. Um, and then for CO2 concerns, so you think about forestation, deforestation, and so on. And then you talk about what will uh, renewables require. And of course, solar requires land surface. So I think there is a trade-off in every case that we need to be careful how we make that choice. Unfortunately, we are limited by time. I, I know because we have five minutes. <laughs> I need to ask your permission. Are you? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yes, there's a gentleman here at the back first. We think yeah. of all the questions. Okay. My, Sir, my name is Siraj, I'm from Myanmar. Uh, Very short one. Yes. No, because we have all these beautiful plans, but how do you, I think our failure of government is we never communicate. We are poor in communicating to the population and getting their support. I think for us to succeed, I think we need to, how, do you, how are you going to communicate? Because don't ignore that part. Because for example, if you want to do it with coal power plants, we need to tell the people, look, we cannot, you know, it's polluting. But we have not given that message to the public, you know. So how are you going to convey the message to the public so that the public gets behind us? We are very poor communicators to the public in the past. Thank you. Yeah, this question is for Dr. Chua. Um, to, in order not to reach over 30 degrees Celsius, the carbon concentration should not exceed 450 parts per million. So as what the mixing has said just now, actually if you check the website, the carbon concentration today is already slightly above 410 parts per million already. So I'm a bit um, concerned about your um, 2017 scenario, which we personally I felt that there's already um, beyond the two degrees already. You know, um, even if we do a simple projection, a linear projection, we will be able to breach our 450 parts per million, even in less than two decades. So I would like to receive your comments on that, please. So let's address the communication part first. Um, uh, communication, um, I really agree with you that the government has a lot of plans because the moment I get into the ministries, I find that there are so many roadmaps and so many plans. But the plans are just the plans and no, not executed. It's a funny cabinet. Uh, right? What, what did you say, Mr. Goy? In the filing cabinet. Uh, all right, in the filing cabinet and for the minister to go and cut ribbon, it's not for it to be implemented. Um, so so I, I totally agree with you. Actually, the, as a matter of fact, the, the one of the persons that actually impact me a lot in my, uh, in my politics is actually um, this mayor of Taipei. I went to visit him, his, uh, uh, Professor Ko, he said this, he said, government likes to make plan. They use two years to make the plan, but by, by the time you finish your plan, the plan is already obsolete. So we are living in a very, very fast world. Um, that is the reason why that, um, why that uh, I actually first cancelled some of the uh, award of IPPs before I actually have an energy plan, because I know that this is critical and it's urgent for us to quickly finish up first and then, then we come up with a plan, right? And uh, anyway, there the consequences uh, we have counted and we can actually do that. Um, so so those are some of the things that I do before we have a plan. For example, um, our Energy Efficiency Act. So Energy Efficiency Act is coming next year. It doesn't mean that you cannot do anything now. So no, you have to do something now. It was drafted and abandoned a few years ago. Ah, yes. exactly. So, so the, the problem with that is that um, not only Malaysia, uh, everywhere else around the world, um, Government really likes to make plan, but there is no political will to implement a plan. Actually, plan is very dynamic. It, it has to be changed, and uh, you don't need a, to have a perfect plan, but you need to execute and have a process to to improve uh, your action. So, so that is what I told them. So, so I actually will, we will have a meeting on the energy efficiency uh, action plan and how are we going to execute it in the while we are waiting for energy efficiency act, etc., etc. So. 
we are on it. Uh, we will we want to act fast because, as uh, Dr. Cho said, we are raising the time. And uh, actually, Malaysia is raising the time for uh, not only environment and, and the economy. We are actually left behind a lot uh, in terms of our economy growth as well. Yeah, so I absolutely agree with uh, Minister Yu's uh, last uh, sentences. Uh, 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 it's a race against time. Uh, time is urgent, and you pointed that out uh, when you cited the numbers on emissions. Uh, and that's why Paris actually was very clear. Unless we peak emissions soon, uh, we, will, we will not be on that uh, pathway that Paris stipulates. So there is a turning point. It has to come within the next seven, eight years. Uh, and if it doesn't come, we're not in this world. But we have two other scenarios where we are above the Paris targets. I, I believe I wish we have more time. Unfortunately, we don't. Um, uh, we, perhaps we can do more often with this kind of engagement. Um, people forget, actually, way back in 2006, Sir Nicholas Stern had actually published a report on the impact of economic, economic impact of climate change. And that has been a good reading, actually, for me myself. And that has started way before Paris discussion. And as many have alluded, there's a lot of discussions, but we really want to see real actions on the ground. That's really important to make change. And it's important to start with every one of us as well. The change of mindset is very, very critical, not only among us. Uh, often we always say that we are too old, this has happened, but it has only happened in our lifetime as well. As much as we consider or concern for future generation. So obviously there's a lot of excitement, hope with the new government. I know there's a lot of trust on you to make this uh, happen. Uh, as Zumin has said, uh, the Energy Efficiency Act essentially was done 10 years ago, yes. but then it was never enacted. Uh, although we do have the Renewable Energy Act has been enacted as well. So there's a lot of exploitation, there's a lot of excitement at the same time. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you to you, YB Minister, for your presence here today. Let's give a thank you to her. Uh, to for supporting this forum as well, thank you, thank you. And Dr. Cho, who came all the way, uh, burning some carbon along the way as well. <laughs> I'm sure you have carbon lost there somewhere. I'm doing a number of different things here, so. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, so I'll pass back to. Before I actually go, um, it actually helps when uh, a young minister actually had this ministry because this ministry is about future and it needs a lot of aggressive, you know, young people are very aggressive. Um, but at the same time, I recognize that being a young minister, I, I lack the experience and right, lack the technology know-how and experts. That is why uh, we are very open right now to, to, we really need your help as an industrial player to come along uh, with us. Um, I see myself not as, uh, I really see myself as a partner of yours and how do I actually put everything together, put every of you together to help us to achieve that, that particular climate goal, environment goal, energy goal. Uh, because the only thing I have is perhaps youth and idealism and perhaps a little bit of communication skill. And the other things, I think we need a lot of help from you. Uh, we need a lot of help from you. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the government will ask for, for you to come for dialogue more often in different one of the things that we are also moving into is uh, zero single-use plastics. Um, so, so some of the things that we will also call for industrial players to come and help. And, and uh, hopefully uh, with the new government that everyone will come and be a part of this uh, new possibility for, 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 the, for the country. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you.